singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can help me make it better by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply going to interviewthefuture.com and becoming a patron. My guest today is Zoltan Istvan. Zoltan is a, a very notable transhumanist. He is the a former presidential candidate for the American uh, presidential elections, several times I should mention. Uh, he is also the founder of the U.S. Transhumanist Party, as well as, among other things, the author of The Transhumanist Wager. He has been a guest previously on my show twice before, so if you guys haven't seen those interviews, I highly recommend you go check them out because today we only have barely about an hour. Zoltan is a busy guy and we have to run through it. So, Zoltan, welcome to Singularity FM again. Thank you so much for having me back. Fantastic. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Zoltan, how have you been? It's been a few years since our last conversation. Yeah, um, I have been good. I mean, in my life, everything is kind of the same and moving forward. Uh, you know, we have, I don't think we've spoken since COVID. So, you know, that obviously was a big turning point, both in the transhumanist movement as well as everyone's lives. But yeah, I mean, all, all things considered, I'm doing pretty well. I, I, I'm not sure if we've also spoken since the documentary Immortality or Bus came out. I think you wrote something on it, which we uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, but yeah, all things considered, I think the big thing in my life is that I'm now um, a graduate student at the University of Oxford. That's actually taking up a lot of my time um, as I focus on kind of transhumanism and a little bit of academic writing. Yeah, I, I, I was quite uh, impressed and surprised, like many others, I bet, that you ended up doing a PhD, I think, right? Graduate school in Oxford University. Is it a PhD program? You know, it's it's a master's right now. It may turn into a PhD. So far, my grades are doing pretty good. But um, honestly, I'm not sure because it's even the master's is so labor intensive. And really, one of the main reasons I felt I needed to go back to school was uh, running these political campaigns. I was one of the only um, candidates without a, without a graduate degree. And I felt like this would be a, a good complement to maybe future political runs as well as adding more credibility, especially in the academic world and the kind of technical world like that. So that's one of the reasons. Uh, whether I do a PhD and pursue that is still an open question, but I'm over halfway through the master's and uh, about to start my dissertation on that. Wow, that's very interesting. So what's your dissertation about, Ben? Uh, I'm not 100% sure what it's about, but I can tell you I, it could very well be about an AI god and a wager that must be made between humanity and um, whether we need to kind of be uh, play the role of being nice to robots, maybe even giving them special privileges and rights uh, in hopes that uh, a future AI God will treat us more nicely uh, rather than um, poorly. And so I've done an early paper on that that was really well received. Uh, and the question is whether I would be expanding on that now from you know 3,500 words to 15,000 words. So it sounds like you're basically working on the alignment problem. Uh, a, a little bit. The, the idea is more, though, that, you know, um, kind of going back to Rocco's Basilic, which you, you probably know of this, this idea that you might have an evil AI god that punishes everybody. And it works off this idea, something we haven't actually talked about in our previous two uh, interviews is, uh, something I discovered since then is is this idea of quantum archaeology and really what quantum archaeology means to both transhumanism and the life extension field. And quantum archaeology is this idea that you might resur technologically resurrect people. If there was a potentiality of doing that, that really changes a lot of the dynamics for both people who like cryonics, for people who are worried about the future, because all of a sudden it's really almost impossible to die, uh, which is kind of foundational shift in how transhumanists view the problem uh, we're dealing with, which is we're going to die. And so the AI God issue, this I, the idea is the AI God might be able to technologically resurrect you using quantum archaeology ideas. And then if it wants to punish you, it can punish you eternally, which is a very different kind of game than being punished for, let's say, 80 years. Being punished for eternity is like horrible and very similar to Pascal's wager. And um, so I've been you know, just thinking about that. But yes, it does cover all those different issues. 
Um, it combines a lot of, you know, theories and it just, it explores it in an academic way. I think that's different. I'm trying to be more academic than journalistic in some of these writings. Very interesting. And and what about the philosophy? My understanding reading one of your posts was that you're doing a lot of philosophy. Um, so what kind of philosophy more specifically are you doing if that's the case indeed? And how do you think that's helpful to you? Well, yeah. So the degree is from the philosophy department at Oxford um, in, and it's in practical ethics. So it's really speculating on the different types of ethical boundaries and ethical implications that um, you know might arise in futurist work and stuff like that. And so I feel like you know it, it's not hard philosophy in the sense of theory of knowledge and epistemology or whatever, but it, it is philosophy in the sense that there's a lot of good versus wrong, you know, and uh, what's a what's a moral right and what's not a moral right and things like that. So um, it is pretty. I got to say, it's pretty intense. It, I got to say, it's much harder than I thought it would be, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not sure I could pursue a PhD is because. The PhD is three to four years of hard work on top of the three years that I'm already doing. So you're looking at a seven-year window of your life in order to just graduate. Um, so I, I, it really, and there's really no way around it. You know, my 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 grades have been good, but they haven't been good enough where I can tell you that I'm just coasting through. I I have to work. So you know, for example, at the New York Times, I used to write a thousand-word essay in maybe a week, maybe 20 hours, right? Um, now the 3,500-word essays are taking me approximately uh, 25 days of maybe five to six hours a day of writing. So the, it's just, it's seven to eight times more labor intensive. And then I, I actually have a renewed respect for a lot of academics. Um, perhaps I was naive to think it was as easy as it was, but I found school to be quite hard. Yeah, I, I can associate with that very much. Uh, it's, it surely is demanding and especially I would imagine in, in ethics or practical ethics, which as you know, I do have a soft spot for. Um, Zoltan, so, okay, we, we're we kind of catching up a little bit on what you're up to and, and what you're doing and what you'll be doing for the next year and a half or so at least, it seems. But let's talk a little bit about the things that happened and maybe the things that didn't happen since our last conversation. So what were... I'm forgetting even uh, the date, but was it about, what is it, four years ago, our second interview? Um, yeah, it was at your place, right? It was your house. Yes. Right, right. You came, I picked you up at the airport. When well, you saw, it's I, I was be there 2017. Speaking, yeah, I was there speaking at a Toronto conference. Um, and I remember you and I were looking at some of the virtual reality gear together i think um, right right yeah right. so but i do remember the the, the, the talk and it was it, it was controversial at, at the time because i had caused a lot of problems in the actual transhumanism movement with the with the presidential run and i think you wanted to get to the bottom of that um i'm thankfully i'm not causing that many problems anymore so i <laughs> um hopefully all is better i mean maybe i still am in some areas but uh, uh i do remember it for that because it was kind of an ex explanation of how things went because uh, at the time a lot of people were sort of upset in the movement with how that campaign was unfolding yeah yeah i remember that and and i remember that at the time i was kind of like sitting at the kind of sidelines and and observing it all and then eventually maybe a year or two later I stopped uh, observing for a while and, and sort of made some proclamations that we may discuss a little bit later. So let's talk first about what are the things that that surprised you since, let's say, 2017 that happened maybe in the world or in your life, if you prefer, and maybe some of the things that surprised you because they didn't happen and they didn't occur that you expected that they would. Well, I, I think the, the, the problem on everyone's tongue is is really Donald Trump that that was the issue that none of us saw even when we were running that really his his method of running politics would change the world and that probably led directly to the Ukraine war as well as all the high inflation now that probably had nothing to do with COVID but the point is that I think everything became very politicized since that moment and everyone's had to kind of decide how strong of an opinion they really want. And I think that's what's happened. In fact, I've seen your opinion become more stronger uh, over time 
Whereas maybe it was more philosophical, the world is okay, let's take a stoic approach. Now it's like, wait a sec, there's actually a, a, a great evil in the world, something that challenges all of us. And, you know, I mean, that's why I ran against Donald Trump in the 2020 uh, primaries, even as a Republican, to try to challenge him, because I dislike the guy myself, not probably nearly as much as you do or others, but still, I felt like democracy was being threatened. So I think that's a huge thing. And that has implications for transhumanism and probably even why we're doing this interview now, because I think you reached out after Steve Bannon had uh, criticized some of my transhumanism work. And it's not the first time that uh, some kind of alt-right or right-wingers have done that. And I feel very strongly that um, Trump would probably have to bash, and he has bashed me personally, he would have to bash uh, transhumanism in order to keep his section of the Republican Party intact, which creates a weird dichotomy because it's not like all liberals are on board with transhumanism either. There are, it's not a, it's not a formulated thought pro process yet. It's not that big of a movement, but it is getting there. And, um, and then in combination with all that, I think in the five years as well, tech companies have obviously become so large because of COVID and whatnot, that now it's like a foregone conclusion that Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, all these other companies, Google rule the world. And that is, something I was supportive of five years ago. And now I'm pulling back and saying, wait a sec, they have grown too powerful uh, in the same sort of way you might say Trump became too powerful. So those are two things that have happened that I think are really scary. You have big tech and you have uh, this kind of energized right wing that is dominating, I think, a lot of things. And again, I, I th I'm, I'm also worried about some of the left wing and progressive politics. I'm sort of more in the center, a little bit more of a left leaning libertarian. But the point is, those two worries have changed the world, in my opinion, and changed media landscape as well. So what's the way to navigate that then? You're a kind of a, you know, a guy with political ambitions. Um, and therefore, for good or for ill, if you were to be successful, you would be the person who would have to navigate especially given that, you know, I'm located here in Canada, so I have to deal with the American reality much less than you have, even though, to be honest, we're so close and we're so tightly knit as economy and culturally and linguistically and in so many ways that as one of our prime ministers once said, when the United States uh, sneezes, we have a thunderstorm here in Canada, you know, because it's like sleeping next to an, an elephant. And of course, obviously, the U.S. is the elephant and we're like the little flea on the elephant's back or something. So so how do you propose that we navigate these extremely treacherous water with extre extremophiles on all sides, as you mentioned? Well, I, I think the first thing we, we I think the, the, the process is being done right now. The process is we need Trump out of the system because he, you know, I think even like uh, DeSantis and some of the other, the Florida governor, he, even he is a lot less mellow than less Trump. So we need to return to a point when the two sides of the party are not necessarily like, they can be in a punching ring, they can be fighting it out. But right now, I think there is an existential risk with, with Trump. And I think um, at the same time, there may be something that's existential with the big giant tech companies getting so much power. And I'm not sure if we need to increase monopolistic uh, control over those kinds of things, or Congress needs to you know, say, wait a sec, we can't just you know, have four companies that are bigger than the economy of all of Europe or something like that. It's not exactly like that, but that's the point. That's kind of where it's going. And I think um, we just need to make sure that whoever gets in charge is able to stabilize this this sense of growing discontent between everybody. And, you know, Biden did a pretty good job of that. I mean, that's why I voted for Biden. Not that I really wanted him in office, but I thought he would balance things out. And he did. Unfortunately, I feel like as long as Trump is out there, there's still this kind of unnerving energy. I think if you could get something like uh, Marco Rubio or something back, all of a sudden we might be back to American politics as it was, and then democracy kind of can continue. And yeah, we're always at each other's throats. That's fine. But it's not, it's, it's very different than what Trump was. I felt like Trump wanted to take it like Putin or China did. He wanted to take it the next level and say, how can I remain in power over or beyond the Constitution? And that's where I thought a lot of the worry was. So we need to make sure we return to a balance that is real political infighting, which is very different than things that incur existential risks. And, um, and I think that means somehow having Trump out of uh, the entire picture um, or people like that out of the entire picture. And I think in this sense, I've really been against censorship on big 
you know, media because I think it's being used the wrong way. But at the same time, I realize that there, there are existential risks out there that are different this time. And um, we need to take this weird feeling that everyone has of civil war in the United States and take it down a couple notches. And that requires leadership that's willing to step up and say, I'm not a fanatic to win votes. I'm a real person who's willing to calm people down. And let's say, let's get America back on track. I mean, we have a real, you know, I, I don't want to say, it's not in any way an enemy, but we have a real competitor out there and that's China. And you can see the economy starting to change. And if we want to, you know, win uh, an economic arms race against China, which I think is in our best interest because we want to remain a democracy, then that's where our, 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 our site should be. So we need leaders that would actually take that vision and apply it there. Instead of right now, it seems like all the application is being applied inward, and that's just making everybody crazy. The left and the right seem to be at each other's throats. Mm. Yeah. So um, I would try to do that if I ran for office again. The problem, though, is that type of approach doesn't win votes anymore. What win, win, uh, wins votes is, uh, I think, being controversial and, uh, you know, and, and, and divide and conquer. And I hate that philosophy because divide and conquer only leads to a civil war eventually, I think. Well, that's very interesting to me that you say that because... Uh, it's interesting that you, I think in the one of the previous presidential elections, you kind of run as a Democrat. Uh, you eventually supported and you flirted with like Hillary's campaign and Bernie's campaign. Um, then you eventually run as a Republican. Uh, now you're saying that, that you voted for Biden. So you're kind of like Republican, Democrat, Democrat, Republican sort of thing. So that's interesting to me. Uh, also, it's interesting to me that at the same time, of course, we all know you have a libertarian sort of, pre, let's say, at the very least, predisposition. Um, also, you're kind of noticing the the dangers that that Trump and and his kind of politics is bringing to the United States. So, so the question then is, and that's that was one of the reasons that prompted my invitation to come back to the show in addition to a few other things that we'll get to in, in, a, in a moment. But um, do you think that conflict is inevitable and has it become more likely since our first conversation? Because when your book came out, that was one of the first things that we talked about at the time. How have things changed since then? Are we more likely or less likely to face conflict? You know, I wrote a, my, my, what's a little bit scary is that Trump has taken uh, almost the playbook of my novel, The Transhumanist Wager. If you would just a apply transhumanism, all of a sudden you have almost like what sort of has happened in it. You know, and as I've said before, I, I support a lot of <clears throat> what Jethro Knights does in The Transhumanist Wager, but it's ultimately a warning. The book is a warning. And the book is also a bridge to how artificial intelligence might think if it wants to seek power at some other point. But, you know, it, it should probably be read as a warning so that we actually can reach a transhumanist future where everyone can live indefinitely through um, life, you know, through, I, I guess, a peaceful democratic means. That's how we want to reach. Uh, that's at least how I would prefer to reach uh, the transhumanist future. Um, but, you know, there's so many different factors motivating. But I, I think ultimately what, you know, you have to be afraid of is that if there is an inclination towards conflict or a growing trend towards it, where does that really end? And I think that could be the worst thing that happens right now. I would prefer not to have a war um, with between transhumanists and non-transhumanists. I would prefer not to have a war between the left and the right, because all that's really going to happen is that <clears throat> technology is going to get stalled. Um, COVID, you know, I think stalled a lot of medical research. It's true that in the end, a lot of companies got a lot wealthier, a lot of tech companies, and that was good. That is now going to maybe pay off. But the reality was for a while, 240 something thousand science experiments got stalled. And that slows down the progress of overall science, of technology, of things like that. And so we want to be very careful <clears throat> of existential risk events, um, meaning events like COVID or events like an asteroid hitting the planet or events where civil war takes down economies for years. Because as you've seen through the growing inequality everywhere, house prices are in Canada, of course, too. Uh, the poor are having a more difficult time than ever to catch up. And that widening of the gap may be good for you know the rich, but it's not good for a huge portion of the population, the greater majority of it. And that will lead to pitchforks. And those pitchforks will slow down you and me trying to achieve uh, an indefinite lifespan through science. 
And so I am totally against war for these reasons, because I think it slows down progress in the things that really matter. The problem, though, is that, as we know, and maybe inevitable, I mean, you, you get leaders out there that push it and uh, – it, it can go the wrong way. When it goes the wrong way, because people are searching for power, it, it doesn't work. And then it really does harm you. And right now, we seem to have a couple leaders around the world between China and Russia, and you know, let's say Trump or whatever. Uh, that that are they truly have a lot of power. So we have to be very afraid of them stalling the world just to embrace their power, but not giving the signs to the people and getting us all to the transhuman future far quicker. Have you gotten more death threats? than before because i remember originally when you came up with your book yeah. you had a number of people who kind of send you death threats uh and i was wondering where you're at because i did get some death threats back back in the day but to be honest the last maybe three or four years it's been sort of quiet on my end of things now obviously i don't have the profile that you have and i've not taken anything remotely close to your controversial positions that you have so that's why i'm curious uh is my personal impression sort of like an outlier or you find the same how, how do you find no there's definitely been less um when the steve bannon thing came out there were a couple <laughs> online and When I wrote this New York Times piece about surfing, my God, I, I enraged an entire community. Uh, and there were a number of them that, well, not necessarily, maybe only one death threat, but a lot of like physical violent threats. Um, but I think what's happening actually is that police and the way we're being tracked is be actually doing a better job at mitigating death threats because it's really impossible these days <clears throat> to do a death threat on Facebook And to not have reported, not like Facebook does a much better job of dealing with death threats these days. And so maybe there are more. I just, we, we're not seeing them. But I think actually, I, I'm definitely playing a much more low key. I mean, I, I get threats when I run political campaigns. That's just inevitable. Um, or when there's a lot, a big news cycle like the, the Steve Bannon thing. But mainly, I'm just an academic these days. And while I do plan to run political campaigns again, I got to say, that's been one of the nice things is not having those threats, especially as, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, <laughs> I just can walk out my door and, and not feel a lot of uh, danger. I mean, one of the threats people will like, you know, I, 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 I'm looking at your house right now, looking at you, you know, that that's freaky. You know, you, then you go to your window, you know, and, or do you even go to your window? Do they have a gun? I mean, that stuff was happening. It was scary. Wow. And do you plan then to run again in 20 for 2024? Um, I do plan to run again. I doubt I'm going to run in 2024. I want to finish the degree. And, um, and I also feel like a, a break gave me a little bit more credibility. I got to say, this is, I, I've done a lot of work in the last um, five years. One thing we haven't talked about is COVID forced me to um, start uh, doing my real estate business again, which has enabled me to do, make a lot more money. So when I do run again, I'll actually have a lot more resources to put at it. And hopefully between the degree and the resource and things like that, You know, I've just become more sophisticated, sophisticated in running these campaigns, what's required, the outreach and stuff like that. So I, I, you know, I hoping that in by 2028, or maybe 2026, I would be um, running for something with a better shot of actually winning. I mean, maybe that, that, that'd be the goal. Right now, and I know you're saying I'm jumping around from parties to party. And it's true, I have been jumping around. If I ran for the president, I'd probably run as a Democrat this time as kind of a middle Democrat with a little bit of a libertarian leaning. Um, but the reality is that uh, I'm still trying to bring science to the public. That is still the main message. It's not about winning yet. So as I get older, you know, especially if I ran for a, maybe a more local position, it would really be about the winning and trying to make change on a fundamental way. But I still consider myself a science candidate trying to use media and trying to use that platform to tell people that, hey, we should be paying attention to the transhumanist world. And believe me, out in Congress, as you know from the presidential debates before, nobody's talking about AI, nobody's talking about genetic editing. It's still obscure and in ivory towers. And despite that, these, these movements, these, uh, this science is impacting our lives and growing bigger every day. I mean, especially the AI debate um, really needs to be taken up with China and other countries developing it very quickly. We're talking about some kind of like arms race that nobody really wants to discuss because it's it's not very good for votes. Um, and yet it's perhaps the most important question in the next 20 years. Well, Steve Bannon is, and his sort of circle are talking about it more than ever, it seems. 
based on that video that you shared and uh, they're actually quoting you if I remember in the claim that conflict is inevitable. Do you think that's a fair representation of what you have said and do, or do you want to qualify that and do you do you feel it's fair the way they're kind of representing you and using you kind of as an enemy to galvanize and mobilize their uh, supporters perhaps into a, even like action not just like fundraising and campaign mobilization but maybe even into something worse sure sure and 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 you know steve bannon is going to have me back on a show once uh we had actually had a date and they pushed it off because he was arrested or something <laughs> so there will be more discussion on this and and i you know the, the statements they're making are true I, I do think a conflict is inevitable i don't know if i want to say war is inevitable but there is certainly at some point going to be um demonstrations riots maybe even people killed death threats that are fulfilled between those who really want to embrace this radical technology in themselves, and I mean cyborg parts, I mean synthetic parts, I mean uploading themselves, connecting to the internet, always watching privacy issues, versus those who absolutely want none of it, and the only thing they want of technology is their AR-15s. And I think there's that kind of conflict is totally inevitable. The question, though, is at the time, what kind of leaders do we have? You know, and this is saying the sort of the same thing with Christianity and transhumanism. Um, it seems like it's a massive conflict. And even five years ago when I was on your show, I was probably talking about it being a massive conflict. But I've, because of quantum archaeology, because of some of these deeper, I think, spiritual issues uh, that can come from technology, I have sort of grown to realize that, well, it's very possible that Christians might actually come on over to the transhumanist side and say, well, Jesus wanted this stuff for us, to, for us to get to know him better. It's not necessarily that we're violating the principles of, you know, the gospel by embracing some technology, especially if the technology helps um, believers come closer to God in the first place, as well as helps the believers leave, live better lives. So, I, I and you know, I used to set it up that there was a conflict, and, and sometimes there still is. I mean, the Pope would, if he was here, he would disagree 100%, say, oh, this is terrible. But I think a lot of Christians are growing up thinking, wait a sec, we may be able to utilize these two fields together for everyone's mutual gain. And if those people holding the AR-15s who are like, no technology, you know, kind of come to the point that, wow, they like, you know, giant tomatoes and they like, uh, you know, Googling and finding stuff and they like working from home and they like using these technologies, maybe driverless cars and even traveling to the Mars someday, whatever it is that's going to become of our transhuman future. They might say, well, wait a sec, this is okay. There's always somebody that holds back and fights against progress. Um, so it may be just a matter of reaching out <clears throat> across the aisle and saying, listen, um, th this is not about changing humanity. We're taking the best parts of humanity. This is just about using technology to do what we've always done, make humans better. And if it's said like that, then I think we can avoid a lot of the bad conflict. I mean, there'll always be the extremists, but I'm talking about... <coughs> uh, you know, what I'm worried about was a real civil war happening because of transhumanism. Yeah, I, I don't know if it will be because of transhumanism or transhumanism would be used as a pretext uh, while the real reasons are much different and much deeper because I think that Steve Bannon in this case is kind of utilizing transhumanism as, as a useful tool to organize and galvanize and mobilize support and, and have a useful enemy, if you will, in some way uh, for his own reasons and purposes. Uh, and, I, you know, even though for, for a variety of reasons, I don't necessarily call myself a transhumanist anymore, I think that transhumanism is not necessarily to blame in this particular case, uh, even though it will probably be blamed uh, but I don't think it, it will be a fair blame in, in this case anyway. Uh, I, I think it's more about, and let's talk here a little bit about leadership because that's where my greatest concerns are. I remember watching a documentary with you where it, like, you're looking yourself into the mirror and you're like saying, huh, I think I'll, I'm going to make a good president of the United States. Don't you think so? <laughs> I think I'll make a good president. Don't you agree? Don't you think so? So what, what do you want to tell us about that? Is that scene missing something? Because obviously 
movies and documentaries, whether in the editing process or in other processes, miss a lot of things that go behind the scenes. Um, well, I mean, I, I think I, I would make a better president than uh, either Trump or Biden right now. Um, and I feel like uh, there are some huge issues that have happened between Roe versus Wade and just progressivism and some of these other things. And I feel like we have two very old people that uh, had been battling it out and um, we need somebody younger. And you're seeing across Europe, a lot of younger women get in some very strong positions and doing some really good work. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see, uh, you know, somebody younger in the presidential, you know, office doing a better job than what's happening right now. That's not to say I'm trying to bash Biden in any way. I, he's, he's balancing a lot of things and we needed somebody older and stable after what happened with Trump. But right now we actually need a lot more leadership, take on China, take on the technology that's changing the world, take on this kind of growing conflict. And I think um, that's, uh, you know, where I feel like I would do a better job, not uh, not trying to, you know, toot my horn too much. And also, as, as we enter the science age, I just feel like we need somebody who is more inclined to, uh, you know, embrace these, the, the new world. And I, I mean, if you even look at Biden's history, there are some very questionable things he did 20, 30 years ago. And that just doesn't go well with what's happening in today's world with a lot of the millennials, younger generation, a lot of the conflicts. I mean, I'm seeing San Francisco um, become a worse city. Uh, there's no question that crime is up and these things. And you need to, it's not like you want to be mean to people, but you do need a good balance of things. And that balance has not been kept. Yeah, I, I agree with you that you would make a better president than Trump. Uh, there is <laughs> thank you <laughs> hardly any debate about that. Uh, maybe even better than Biden, possibly. So I don't know about that. But my concern is about your policy sort of pr platform, if if I could find one, or uh, let's say record, maybe. That that makes me concerned about that. So so let me put it this way, and and you know we know sure. each other sufficiently well enough. You've been in my house. You've met my wife. Uh, you know we, we know each other well. Um, at one point, I came out of the woodwork and started criticizing you for a number of things. How did you feel about that? Especially given the context that you wrote a very generous review of my book. Uh, as as I said, you've been to my podcast. Uh, you mean you've been you've been to my house. Uh, you've said good things about me in the past, and yet here I started being increasingly more and more critical of you. Well, first off, I think your book is really good, so I, I'm not. I wouldn't use a personal vendetta against somebody. And, and also, I think your criticism of me was not as strong as some others like Lincoln Cannons or some of those other people. They really some people in the transhumanist movement came out. And they made it their life's mission to bash me. And that I thought, like, look, you can be against what I'm doing. You can be against the, my political runs and this and that or my extremism, because there's no question I my platforms were. And even now, I mean, I um, openly admit I'll take the Steve Bannon uh, publicity and use it to push transhumanism forward. But it didn't really bother me too much that I think uh, you came out and criticized my work. I think you were... You, you've always been a, a hard-going uh, journalist. I saw what you did with Singularity University. You're, you're, a, you're someone who goes after um, uh, things that you think are right or wrong, and you go after it hard. And actually, as a, as a journalist myself, I've always appreciated that. I also think, you know, people like you and I have to develop thick skin and, and know that when someone goes after you, it's not a personal thing. It's it's what they believe is right because of all their prior circumstances. So you have to kind of just take it as it is. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of life. Yeah. Okay. So in my case, it was definitely not meant to be a personal thing. It was more about the policies. And I'll give you several examples that, that really turned me off. So one was, and, and then I'll give you, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you back on the show, so that I give you an opportunity to address maybe some of those issues and correct me if I'm wrong. So, for example, I started getting the vibe more and more that you're obviously very knowledgeable and skillful at manipulating the media attention and of playing that game of extremes. And I can even give you some leeway you know, because you need to grow a profile to do a political campaign or to make a difference in the world at any rate. So I'm I'm 
willing to cut people a lot of slack on that. But I stopped cutting that slack in a moment when, let's say, on the one hand, you tell me something like, I care a lot about refugees. I really care a lot about refugees. So why don't we microchip them all that come to the United States and watch them for the next however long time to see if they're really criminals and murderers? To me, the, that's that's like... First, it's unconstitutional, obviously, but 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 secondly, it it's incompatible with your care. It, it shows a primary focus on uh, kind of populism and contra being controversial rather than useful in addressing the the issue. Another thing which really bugged me was like your idea about selling public parks and land, whether in California or whether in the United States in general. And my concern with that was that there's a number of documentaries that have very well documented uh, cases where proposals like that have been actually implemented, most notably in places like Utah. And you see the consequent effects are utterly devastating for the First Nations or the Indian communities there, for the archaeological and historical artifacts, for the natural artifacts. At every level, it's an utter devastation and it doesn't seem to work. And so my concern when I see you do stuff like that is that really you 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 seem to me to be more uh, careful about staying at the crest of the wave of publicity rather than having proper good policies policy proposal that proposals that work that go to the depth of thing. So where am I wrong here? What am I missing in this claim or this perception of mine? Sure. Well, I mean, um, let's talk about refugees. Look, th this is the most humanitarian thing we can do. You have Republicans who d don't want them in at all, and you have Democrats who will allow them in kind of wholesale. But um, I feel like a good way to allow more in to, to satisfy Congress is to kind of maybe somehow monitor them. And that way you could have more in and satisfy both the Republicans and the Democrats. So in my opinion, that was kind of a, a humanitarian type of decision when I talked about microchipping. I don't think microchipping is a big deal, frankly. So I thought it was kind of like an easy way to go to satisfy, you know, kill, I guess. But we are monitoring stuff. those people in a way that, for example, they pay taxes. We monitor them when they find a job. We monitor them if they get arrested because uh, that gets reported and logged into the system. We're monitoring them in a number of ways, whether they go to work, whether they get in jail, uh, whether they have a, a legal case for or against them, whether they uh, collect uh, some kind of an aid like social security or not. Whatever they do, they're being monitored like all of us without having to have microchips in us. The system is collecting those data points and it's not so hard to connect those nowadays at all. And, you know, nowadays you, you microchip dogs like our dog, like had a micro, like most dogs now have microchips, not people. So there's so many layers with, with you're talking about, you're talking about people that are suffering in like war zones. So sure. if this is an alternative to get them into a country, then I thought that was the more humanitarian thing to do than to like keep them out, which is what Congress is doing. So if you could find a middle way, then you're actually saving lives. So this was, and I know everyone got mad at me about this, but this was one of my like uh, my big you know things that I was like, oh, we can do, we can do, you know, and it, it would actually save lives. So, but I realized people are upset, you know, it's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, because look, Canada's taken per capita ten times more than the United States. Like we are only about a thirty-six million um, people country, and we have taken. Uh, 10 times more refugees uh, during t Trump and even during Biden now per capita than the United States. And we don't microchip them. So in other words, the end, there's countries that have done 10 times more than Canada, like, for example, Germany, Sweden. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if Norway was one of them, but Germany and Sweden definitely have, uh, just as two other examples. And they're not doing it by microchipping people. So I'm trying to say is like, you can have the, you can be nice, you can take the people, you can help them, you don't need to microchip them. No, I, and I, I totally hear your point of view. And, I, and let me just say on the national parks thing, actually, my policy was never to do national parks. 
uh, my policy was that we would always exclude them. So I'm kind of, I, I think maybe- What other public land would allow you to raise the coffers or, or fill the coffers? As well, I mean, there's an, enor- yeah, there's an enormous amount of public land out there. I think, um, you know, I mean, California has something like uh, 40 million acres. So, you know, and, and most of it's unused and most of it's not Indian land either. Most of it's just like sitting there owned uh, by the federal government. And okay, some of it is used for logging. There's a little bit of money being made on it, but it's really not too much. So, you know- and when you talk about like the amount of poverty, we've got 13 million people in California living in poverty. And that's like under 22 or $23,000 a year. So kids are hungry. Um, I was like, why don't we take some of that public land and commercialize it or monetize it in some way to, you know, feed these children. And, uh, and so, you know, it sounds like, oh my God, he's killing the environment, selling off national parks. But what he's really trying to do is take those 13 million people living in squalor in California and America, there's, you know, 40, 50 million, whatever, and give them a chance based on the federal resources that are out there that are largely unused. Now, I never would have sold national parks or things like that, but there's a huge amount of land that's just empty and maybe being used for logging, but not really at the right prices. I mean, you, you could create huge amounts of money. You could probably easily wipe out all the college debt in one year. I mean, there, there's so many things you could do with it. You could definitely feed all the children. You could probably make uh, so many public universities free and all these other things. But you have to actually be willing to sell or monetize some of that land for the common good. And I know that sounds terrible to environmentalists, but to somebody like myself who actually, you know, has a humanitarian bent, that, that seemed like a pretty solid idea. And, I, you know, I stand by that idea still, just like I stand behind the refugee idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know I you. know nobody likes that, but uh... good for you. Yeah, my concern is that let's let's say the sale of, of federal land. It's a one shot kind of thing, whereas the problem that you have to address is ongoing. So it's going to give you a shot in the arm, but in many ways it's going to entrench the 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 the, the economic polarization because obviously the the rich people are going to buy those private lands and then they're going to seclude access to them to the poor people even more so than before because now at least if you're poor you can go have access to all those federal lands Uh, but if they're privatized forget it people are going to fence them in put robot guards with AR-14, 15s and start shooting people on site if they want to go into their own property, right? Yes, yes. So ultimately, though, um, I think it was something like 75% of that land had to be leased and only 25% could be sold of the entire thing. So America would still be left with, I think, 120 million acres of leased land, meaning that they could get it back. And no lease was supposed to be over 25 years. So you would really not be selling too much of the federal land, and you would be leasing most of it out. And I think uh, that's, uh, you know, th- there's a big difference between leasing. And I'm also, you know, just this gets a little bit more transhumanist, but with nanotechnology coming out every day, coming up with better ways to grow trees and recreate environments, you know, my hope is that in 25 years, we'd have such amazing technology, we could go back into let's say, uh, you know, a hundred acre parcel that Exxon had oiled and replace it, make it into something beautiful again through tech, you know, these new types of nanotechnologies, make it maybe even more beautiful, more animals that lived there before through genetic engineering and things like that. So my idea was we would take a bit of a haircut now, uh, give the shot in the arm to the people that need it with hopes that that would create the kinds of technologies in the future to beautify our country as it never once was, as it, you know, as it maybe it once was, or it could be as we imagine it. And I think that's very much, you know, like in line with a long-term vision that's both environmentally friendly, but also, um, you know, it, it does a job that needs to be done now, which is that we have poverty. And, you know, basically it was called the federal land dividend, this whole idea. And I've, I've written a lot about, it, and there's a lot of writing on it as well. And, you know, you would be providing a universal basic income that would provide universal basic health care as well as, you know, probably access to education, things like that through this money. So when you talk about a universal basic income, this is how I got to it without raising taxes. And that's what made this kind of, uh, you know, a unique idea. Let, let's talk about uh, a little bit about that kind of what you mentioned about the rejuvenation uh, whether of land or other things, because that's another thing that that I've had struggled with, um, and and kind of ultimately ended up pushing me away from transhumanism. 
You know, I got tired of going to a number of events, conferences, uh, much less so during my keynotes, because when I do my keynotes, my audience is different. But uh, I used to meet a lot of transhumanists who would always tell me, oh, don't worry about, uh, you know, this or that animal going extinct because, you know, we're going to bring them back. It's okay. You know, the passenger pigeon went away, the Tasmanian devil went away, but you know, we're transhumanists, we're going to bring them back. So don't worry about any damage we may be doing today. We're all going to fix it up later. And, and you know, that, that kind of gives us a blank check, doesn't it? To, to do whatever we want to do with the world, with the animals, with any other sentient being in the near to medium term, in the hope, and right now that's all we have, hope, that somehow in the future, you know, and, and you know, I'm a big skeptic on quantum archaeology per se, but because it's it's kind of I, I, I wanna... am too, <laughs> but I know what you mean. It's it's totally out there, and we're, there's no proof it works. Right. So, but but my Mike, I was starting to see more and more people who would tell me, "Stop worrying about the world. Stop worrying about the extinction events. Stop worrying about this or that. We're transhumanists. We're gonna fix it up down the road." And I was like, no, the problems are right now. And it, to me, it as a philosopher and as an ethical philosopher, it's a useful excuse uh, of bad behavior now on the promise that you would fix the damage in the future. But a good ethical person, uh, you know, prevents poor behavior today to avoid having to fix it tomorrow. That's what ethics is all about, paying the price now and not delaying it in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I mean, I hear that. I, I guess that's where it comes down to who's like an optimist and who's not, and who's going to base something on a future projection versus not. And there are plenty of instances where you're right. Something bad has uh, someone said they was going to do this, and then it it didn't happen. And then there are plenty of instances where someone had a vision, and it turned out to be actually better for the environment. But um, you know. Uh, I'm still an optimist. I still believe we're going to make a much better earth here in 25 years or 50 years than we do now, but we have to get there. And in the meantime, you know, there are what, 10 million kids going to bed hungry every night in the United States. I'm not sure, probably in Canada, you guys do a better job of that, but we, we have a lot of incredible poverty here. Uh, and that, that needs to be addressed and can't be addressed by Congress. They've had hundred years to do it, never done anything about it. We need to address in kind of systematic ways, something like a universal basic income based on land values, because that's about the only thing that goes up consistently with uh, inflation. And that way we can kind of protect everyone. And we're just sitting on these natural resources without actually using them to help hungry kids. It just seems like we could do a lot better in that. And everyone's like, where do we get the money? And I'm like, there's the money right there. You know, it's uh, it's sitting out there. And the only thing we, you know, when your big complaint is that someone builds fences and you can't access it, but not that many people access a lot of the federal lands anyways. And it's not like we were taking all of them out of the picture. Uh, like I said, I, the, my plan never would have touched national parks. So I just, when it comes down to the same thing with the refugees and the, the same thing with, uh, you know, the other one that everyone always bashes me on is I wanted to license uh, children. And uh, it comes down to the same thing. It's like, if we had stronger parents, only parents that were ready to have, you know, childbirth, then, we wouldn't have so many hungry kids and we wouldn't have so much crime later in the road. So it just takes a lot of responsibility of the of people today to say these kinds of things, to say, to make some hard decisions. And those decisions require sacrifice, but the end result will be dramatically less poverty, less hungry kids, people that have more <coughs> prosperity in their life. Sorry, I think I could told you I have some COVID. So if I cough a little bit, um, but I, I really think ultimately speaking, almost all my policies come back to humanitarian way. They just cause a little bit of suffering to get there. And that suffering is yes, the environment might take a hit. And yes, some of the freedoms of people might take a hit. And yes, you know, other people are like lose some of the rights to do things for just a little bit. But in the long run, everybody has a hopefully better life, especially children. Yeah, I, I apologize, my friend. I, I'm just not convinced that, that what you're offering would get us there, but but that may be just me. So uh, people can judge for themselves. Uh, you know, another thing is the, the silver bullet. Uh, transhumanists, uh, in my view, very often look at technology as literally like a silver bullet. Uh, like it's going to solve all of our problems. And 
you know, in, in the last, especially during COVID, I think that was shown to be demonstrably wrong because we are using more technology that, than we've ever used in the history of our civilization. And we are more unhappy, we're more depressed, more lonely, more suicidal than ever before. And according to 12 Nobel laureates and 120 of the best scientists who set the nuclear doomsday clock, we are now closer to self-destruction than we've ever been in the history of our civilization. I think it's about 100 seconds to midnight currently that they've set the clock at. And they've left it there, by the way, for the last three years, which is the longest, the shortest period. And it's been sitting there for the longest ever, much w worse than, let's say, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So on the one hand, we have more technology than ever before, which if that's the silver bullet, we should be happier and safer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, some of the smartest people are telling us we're closest to self-destruction than we've ever been. And on the personal level, we're more suicidal than ever. And we are killing ourselves, by the way. It's a, it's a global epidemic too. So that would appear to suggest that there doesn't seem to be a positive relationship between the amount of technology that we can observe or even measure in our civilization and either mental happiness or even safety for our at the civilizational level. So uh, I, I do hear what you're saying, and I follow these statistics too. Um, I, th I think one thing is that we can't really, we're talking about like the last five, 10 years. We, we really need to take a longer timeline horizon because it's really hard for me, like, I have really started to say openly, I think social media is a disease. It's going to be like smoking. And one day we're all going to wake up and say, how? Because a lot of the very smart people I know are literally will not be on it anymore because of what they see that it does to their brain. They're just like, oh my God, this, this just makes me addicted. I fight with people. Oh, I don't even know. It makes me crazy. And I feel like um, Facebook is like getting into a bad relationship with somebody, you know? And I feel like more and more people are realizing that. So a lot, some of the stuff you said might actually have a lot to do with social media and just the media environment, which has changed. I mean, it, now it's all clickbait and it's like uh, very rare. Do you see any good journalism anymore? Maybe though over a 10, 20, 30 year horizon, we will see what I think is still in place, uh, a very strong historical trend that technology and science improves the lives of all people as it has been doing for hundreds of years now, you know, as we systematically eliminate things like, uh, you know, uh, the various diseases, even like COVID, you know, and as, as we systematically make it so that people live longer and there's more money in the system so people are more prosperous. There's no question we're at a kind of a downhill right now, uh, it seems. But I wonder if that's really a, a, a real statistical trend or is that just going to be a little blip that all of a sudden we come back when people start figuring out how to live, you know, how to, when new technologies make our lives better. And, uh, you know, this could come from something like uh, a, a genetic editing CRISPR shot that makes you happy all the time. You know, and there's something, uh, it's some, no, there's something that they're working on in Oxford. One of my professors is, has talked quite a bit about it. And, um, you know, there, it could come down to a time when a lot of us figure out that we're, we can be much nicer, better people just by doing something, you know, almost the equivalent of like meditating for a half hour, except it's a pill or something. These things may come and then all of a sudden we'll say, oh my God, technology is great again. So I just, I caution against the blip we're seeing now as being a real trend. I'm not saying it's not, you may be right, but um, I caution against that. But that's, but that's what worries me because that, that's what I call techno solutionism. That's why I call it the silver bullet because when you have social problems, you may not necessarily have a technical solution, but you have to have a social and political and ethical solution ultimately. Not, a, not. I mean, the technological uh, progress would be extremely helpful and probably is necessary to the degree that we can't do it without science and technology, obviously. But it's not sufficient because ultimately when you have a social problem, just like look at the United States, the issues there that you're talking about, let's say feeding those kids are not issues of abundance. They're not issues of lack of technology. You have the food, you have the technology to produce food. The United States is one of the biggest food producers in the world. And yet California per se, and California has the largest number of technology and billionaires. And yet it's the poorest state 
per capita in the United States if you take into consideration the standard of living. The cost of living is so high and relative to that the income is so low that one out of five people is at or below the brink in the United States. So it's like the golden state is like the poorest state in, in the nation, believe that or not. Uh, and and so that to me is a perfect example that you have the money, you have the technology, you have the science, you have the produce to feed people and yet you're not doing it. Why? Because those are not sufficient. You need to have the social consensus to make it work. And so the techno solutionism is not enough. It's not going to work. It didn't work in California. It's not going to work elsewhere. Well, again, I, I think if you look at a historical standard, it has actually done huge positive things for all people. I mean, the fact that we don't die from cavities and we have hot water and things like that. You're right, though. I mean, in many levels, when you look at it compared to the rest of the world, we uh, the, the extra technology has not necessarily helped us overcome our social problems. Maybe that's a capitalism problem. And, and I, you know, I'm all for capitalism, but I have begun, you know, as you know, really supporting a kind of a socialism that's underneath that protects everybody through a form of a universal basic income, because I just don't think everybody is cut out to make it in the capitalistic world. Uh, there are just some people who, A, don't want to take, you know, capitalism really requires you taking from somebody else. And um, and I think, uh, I mean, they usually give it to you in return for something, but oftentimes it's not always that case. And I think um, a lot of people aren't cut out for that kind of dog eat dog world. And I think that's okay not to be, and they should have that social kind of umbrella underneath them uh, that would keep society operating much more uh you know in a, in a better way at least social cohesion stays strong and 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 we just don't have so many homeless i mean the homeless in california has become unbelievable how crazy it is so we I should know. do something about that and i i would pay higher taxes or whatever it is um but i just don't know if this is a technological issue this might just be america not, but that's what that's what i've been saying look at it this way in canada we have 36 million people or so, which is about roughly the size of California, my understanding is. Uh, now, in all of Canada, and I'm sure the statistics are incorrect, you have something like 40 to 50,000 homeless people. That's in all of Canada. You know, you have multiple times more, just like in LA, right? Yeah, no, now, I think San Francisco, think, we have more than that <laughs> yeah, in the Bay now, Area. Th think about it this way. Canada has less money than the US, less capital, less technology, uh, less of everything that I can think of, and yet we're doing better job of distributing what we have. And the same is true of Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, you know, the list is endless. It's like many other countries that are doing much better job than Canada with less resources. So therefore, it's not a technological problem. It's not a, uh, it, it's more a problem of political consensus of, 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 of allocating those resources, if you will, of the story within which we set the rules of how we're going to split the pie. I, I totally agree with you. I think the problem, though, is that, you know, we originally started saying that technology may be responsible for some of the downfalls no, of society, no, but I, not I, I, responsible, I, insufficient, insufficient. I, I just feel like Technology is this neutral force that shows to be improving history, people's prosperity, people's lives, their lifespans, everything, you know, even their happiness levels. It just seems like right now we're going through this blip, but the blip could have a lot to do with, in my opinion, just sort of bad political policies that have gone on endlessly. I mean, you talked about earlier me on this crescendo, like, you know, on the top of the wave. It's true. Like, as a politician, you sort of got to stay where the news is. If you decide to deviate from where the news is breaking, you won't get any attention. You won't get any votes. This is a total catch-22, because if you don't stay at right where everything is breaking, as you put it, then you can't actually even make a difference. And yet staying right where everything is breaking sometimes means compromising your values in order to stay there for the greater goal, the greater good. And this is a very tough place for politicians to be because they can barely say anything that they actually want without being so criticized and losing votes. So half the time they just go with whatever is happening and the changes are so incremental. And over time, the incrementalness of the nature of the changes has led to a huge division in inequality now where, you know, you have <laughs> hundreds of thousands of homeless in America versus <coughs> a place like your country 
which is dramatically less. You still have these divisions in the politics, but I, I think you've done a much better job of somehow allocating those resources, whereas America still is capitalism, you know, unfettered. I mean, it's just, it's really kind of, I don't want to say the Wild West, because uh, a lot of entrepreneurs would disagree with that tremendously, but we can still do so much of what we want to do, even if that means screwing over the poor people, which is what a lot of rich people still end up doing these days. Yeah, just one strange fact that is hard to explain is the fact that the average Canadian lives three and a half years longer than the average American, given though that we spent half the money that you guys spent on healthcare per capita, which like means we're getting four years better lo longevity for half the price, literally. Uh, sure. So but I do want to say just one thing in defense of the, of the American system. A, a lot of the creation of drugs through entrepreneurship and whatever does stem from the United States. And that stems from a doggy -eat dog kind of atmosphere. A lot of us uh, would not go out into the world and risk our, our money or our time, whatever, if we didn't feel we were going to get a huge return. Now, sometimes those returns are outrageous. And I mean, it's, it, in my opinion, it's crazy. You have someone like Jeff Bezos who has 250 million or whatever billion, you know, versus most people don't even have 50,000. That, that does seem kind of crazy. But at the same time, America does have a system where they continue to innovate. That innovate does trickle out to the rest of the world and is able to keep, for example, the Canadian healthcare system um, with newer drugs that maybe Canada wouldn't have had the money up front to produce or create. And so it's a catch-22. Maybe one nation always has to take it on the head. But that, 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 that form of, I just want to mention, that form of capitalism at least has been producing this innovation, even if it has been hurting people all along. Yeah, but then you have cases like insulin. Insulin was invented in my alma mater of University of Toronto. The guy who invented it released it for a dollar to be available to everyone in the world and basically has been a public domain drug since I think it was invented in about 1927 or thereabouts, and it was the fastest ever given Nobel uh, 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 Prize in medicine because it immediately started saving life. Lives and almost a hundred years later, look at what's happening now. Americans are traveling to Canada in busloads <laughs> to be able to buy themselves insulin because the cost of insulin in the United States is so prohibitively expensive. A hundred years after the invention of insulin, and after the fact that the guy who invented it gave it away literally for a buck. Yeah, right? no, I know. So, so. Yeah, you have some point there that, you know, inventiveness and entrepreneurship must be rewarded. Okay, fine. But but then we get into all this kind of, is it? No, and, no, and you, you have a point too, because you're right. I mean, how could, I mean, my father was a diabetic, you know, so how could it be that expensive? It's crazy. I mean, you would think that this would be something that the government and, and just companies would step in and say, oh, we don't need to make a fortune on this. And yet they are making a fortune on it. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of big pharma. I, I'm grateful that they create drugs and whatnot, but I've never been a big fan of pharma. I think uh, I'm not sure if, you know, especially, you know, what we're transhumanists are trying to do is <clears throat> create a world where there's no disease. So of course, big pharma is not a big supporter of what I'm trying to do too, because in my perfect world, there is no pharma companies. We don't need any more. We have solved all disease and aging and things like that. But you know, I've seen what they've done. I've watched all the documentaries. It, it, you know, I, I'm not a fan of Mike Moore, but uh, he's he's done some great investigative journalism on how big pharma has been has done some very crooked things. And I think insulin is a pretty good example of that of that entirely. Yeah, Zoltan, unfortunately, our hour flew by so quickly. Um, what can I say? We have maybe three or four questions to wrap our conversation. So so let me go at bang, bang, if possible. Sure, sure. Uh, one thing here is that transhumanism has this, and this is probably the last kind of larger question, and then we're going to close it up. Transhumanism seems to have this idea that um, we are a brain with a body rather than a body with a brain. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and about if that could be a misrepresentation? Because evolutionary biology tells us that we are a body with a brain. And if that's the case, that has a very 
profound, even philosophical consequences for what transhumanism tells us about mind uploading, about what's running what, about whether intelligence is, is the driver or intelligence is the passenger and maybe biology is the driver. And in transhumanism, the presumption is, no, we are a brain with a body and therefore mind uploading and et cetera, et cetera. So what do you want to say about that kind of issue? Well, that is a good, uh, you know, a, a good question because, uh, and, and I agree with you. First off, I'm not an expert on this, and the science out there is still confusing, and nobody knows the real answer. Though, thankfully, you know, some of the experiments they're doing with pigs' brains in Yale right now and reanimating them is really offering a little bit more insight. If you can recreate similar brain patterns, and those brain patterns can at some point be translated into consciousness, so that we might be able to understand or language as we would have it. We might be able to decipher this kind of puzzle better. But I do believe ultimately that we are not our bodies. We are just up here. And we're going to be able to even recreate that sensation of bodies through robotics or things like that. It may require us in the very beginning to have arms and legs and hearts to feel who we are because a huge part of our sense sensory is like if you feel pain in your hand or whatever, it's, it's pain. But I think ultimately we're going to figure out how to be intelligences without physical attributes um that's not to say right now that that controversy has ever been is going to be solved uh, that controversy may go on i just think we're going to be able to trick ourselves out of believing that uh, out of having to even need a body at some point with the tech technological innovation and that's how we get around that but uh, um, i have read a lot of those and I, I really don't <laughs> i know that that's an ongoing debate we, they discussed this at oxford as well and uh, there are people on both sides at the moment yeah, I'm starting to be more on the side of we are a body with a brain rather than at least that's what evolutionary biology tells us because our brain is like one hack on top of another hack on top of another hack, all in the service of the body. That's how it's developed and all in the service of the stomach in a way, if if you think about it. Of, and maybe if you listen to Richard Dawkins, all <laughs> to in the, the service DNA, right. of the I'm, selfish gene. Yeah, I right? just, just referenced his book recently in one of my essays. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It may all come down to DNA or even, uh, you know, what are these, uh, do we have like 70 million microbes in each of our bodies or trillion microbes, whatever it is. Trillion. So something like, yeah, it, it, it's something like that. Imagine if that's ultimately what's been running the show and it would be a very humbling moment for a humanity. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think whether those things are true or not, we're going to come to a point when you're right, it is a hack upon a hack upon a hack. And I love that example. But I think we're going to be able to figure out a hack that makes that replaces the hack that makes us even believe. And at some point, we might transition out of those hacks entirely. So I do believe we'll come to a consciousness that's far superior to ourselves, where we can embed ourselves into it, that will not have a body be entirely ones and zeros, or whatever else it's going to be in the future. You know, the AI age may not last that long either. It's got to be something beyond it as well. Do you think we're moving along the kind of previously predicted and projected and perceived timeline towards whether the singularity and AI or whether you know, transhumanism, merging of men and machine, mind uploads, things like that. Are we moving slower, faster, given the time frame since our last conversation? Well, I, yeah, I, I think um, in terms of AI, maybe uploading consciousness, we're, we're a few years behind, but we're still pretty close to our original timelines. Um, you know, I would say sometime by 2050, 2055, we're going to have real consciousness in AI that rivals our own. We're going to have the ability, if you look at, you know, the, the amount of money being pumped into Silicon Valley now with uploading consciousness and thoughts and telepathy, we probably have a good, and, and brain scans, that's another type of way of reconstituting it. I think those, those things are still relatively, you know, back to Chris Weil's original predictions, maybe he's too early, but we're pretty close. Um, what I think has really been disappointing though, and, and I wrote a paper on this, is I think the ability to overcome death, I was greatly uh, over-enthusiastic about uh, seven or eight years ago. And we haven't made nearly as many strides as I thought we would. Now, that said, so we're, we're behind on that by a lot. But that said, a huge influx of money in the last two or three years has gone directly into that field. 
So now it just might be a matter of time before we catch up. But whereas I would have told you, oh, I have a good shot of living indefinitely, um, I would say I have a much better shot of probably ending up being frozen, you know, uh, because I, I'm not going to make it at, at age 49. I probably will not make it to that, you know, escape longevity kind of phase where you can actually count on science to keep us alive. And that's something that has changed in 10 years. Um, so I was wrong there. Uh, and too over enthusiastic and COVID didn't necessarily kind of help. It didn't, it's hard to know exactly what COVID played in that role, meaning that did RNA technology creation speed us forward or genetic editing, things like that. It's hard to know right now because a lot of science experiments were put on hold, some were canceled, but uh, at the same time, a lot of money went directly into uh, producing vaccines. And I think we gained some insight there into the scientific world, but overall, I'm quite disappointed with how fast um, we are moving on that front. And uh, I'm watching uh, a lot of people get older. Uh, I'm watching some people pass away that had hoped we would be there by now. And now I'm beginning to worry that at age 49, my father died at 73. I probably won't make it myself. And that if I come back, it'll be because I'm reanimated or reconstituted in some weird way. It's not that my body will make it. Do you have a cryonics plan B kind of? Um, I don't right now, thankfully, because I'm so healthy, but I, I, I certainly would go, I think, to Alcor or something like that if I felt I was sick or I had cancer. So I would do that. I, I just... I, 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 What if you I, get hit by a car or shot by by a right-wing nutcase or something, like one of Steve Bannon's, like, <laughs> apes? Yeah, yeah. Then I, I, I'm, I would be foolish for not have signed up for cryonics yet. But I've been a little reluctant to do it just because it really has only been in the last year at Oxford and writing this essay that I realized that I was way too over enthusiastic about the progress of life extension science. And uh, because really the, what academic writing does is it forces you to look at people who disagree with you and analyze their viewpoints. And I, I had no choice but to admit that I was uh, too optimistic. And uh, so this revelation is sort of hitting me and maybe uh, maybe the cryonics thing will happen in the next 12 or 18 months, just in case somebody shoots me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Uh, we have our differences, but uh, I hope not. I, I definitely would not enjoy hearing that news for you or for, for anyone else, by the way. Um, Zoltan, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Well, I think the best thing is just to Google my name. Yeah, uh, you know, with quotes, and you'll find all stuff. There's still quite a bit of news coming out all the time, and I'm still doing interviews. Uh, definitely less because I'm not on the campaign trail, but um, I do have a bunch of nonfiction books that have come out since we did our last interview. Uh, the best is the Future Resist Cure, which <clears throat> has like 50 of my best essays that were all published. Um, and then, of course, there's a transhumanist wager on Amazon. But just Google my name, and I'm on Twitter and uh, places like that, hanging out. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in the next year or two, uh, I definitely will put together a book of my Oxford essays. It'll be about 50,000 words, uh, whether I do the PhD or whether I try to do something like that or not. And, and there's no guarantee I do the PhD in England as well. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but you can just Google to find out more information. And of course, ZoltanEshvan.com is my website. Zoltan, you always know that I give the last word to my guests. Uh, we've had a very kind of a diverse, quick kind of varied uh, conversation today. What's the best way you want to wrap it up for us? And what's the best way that you want to send us away? What's the, the message perhaps, or something that you want to send us away with? Well, first of all, I hope the interview was okay. Because I, I, like I said, I am a little sick, probably from COVID at the moment. But uh, uh, I, uh, I think the most important thing I want to say is probably what I just said at the end. And it's something we didn't talk about, but it, it is a new idea uh, of mine, which is that I was too optimistic about life extension science. And if I thought we were in a battle to save lives with it, we are more in a battle than ever before. Because uh, if I'm some of the projections I'm coming with up with are right, it may even be challenging for our children to live indefinitely, um, to have life extension science by 2100. And uh, that, that actually can reverse aging. So we need more people to go into science. We need more money to do it. There's actually a lot of money in it now. What's really scary is we only have about 5,000 scientists around the world 
dedicated directly or specifically to life extension science. So in order to make it so that you and I can live a lot longer and people we love can live a lot longer, we need a lot more scientists to go into those fields. So uh, it's, it's just something that's happened in the last year that I've sort of come to realize, like, you know, there's a bunch of us that are out there saying, oh, we can do this, we can do this. But <clears throat> if we don't actually have people on the ground doing it, then it doesn't get done. It's just people like me in the media screaming. And that needs to be a lot more than that. It has to actually be scientists at, at uh, you know, research labs. So hopefully if you're listening to this and you're wondering what to do with your life, go into the sciences and become a researcher or a scientist or an engineer or something, because we need more of you. The, the, the army of 5,000 people is not going to be uh, sufficient to overcome death. It's going to take an army of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of researchers and scientists with a lot more money to overcome death. So we need a lot more scientists to do life extension. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Zoltan Istvan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 